Well, hello, this is Jeff Gadiosi, and you're on MisplaceStraws.com, where music comes to life. And my guests today are here to talk about a really special project that needs your help. Danny Garcia is one of the top documentary filmmakers working today. He was on the site a few years back when he released his film on Brian Jones of the Rolling Stones. He's also done films on Stiv Bader's, The Clash, Johnny Thunders, and more. And he's here today with his new project called Nightclubbing, The Birth of Punk Rock in New York City, which is the story of Max's Kansas City. Also joining us today is the queen of Max's. You cannot tell the story of this legendary club without the icon herself, Ms. Jane County. Danny, yeah. Jane, welcome. Pleasure to have you both. Thank you for having us. <laughs> <laughs> so, Danny, first of all, there have been a ton of movies and documentaries, and rightfully so, on the impact of CBGBs, but not much has been done on Max's. What led you to want to tell the story of Max's? Well, actually, everything started like seven years ago when I got a call from Tommy Dean and his daughter. Tommy was the second and last owner of Max's. And he, he had watched my documentary on Johnny Thunders and he wanted me to make a documentary on Max's. And he started telling me about the counterfeit money operation he was running in his basement. And I thought that was fascinating. But, you know, he passed away and, you know, I told him I needed money for all these music rights that I'm, you know, crowdfunding for today. And so the idea sort of dissipated, you know, disappeared when he died and stuff. And then I got this footage of Sid Vicious' life with Maxis. And it's amazing, you know, and all my life I've been told they sucked and it was the shows were terrible and stuff. And this footage proves the opposite. They were actually really hot. You know, we have to say that it's actually footage from the very last show. So they were cooking, you know, by the last Saturday night they played there or whatever. And I tried to do something with it um, regarding Sid, Live and Max's. And I started interviewing people, but the interviews were a bit lame and sad and, you know, didn't have any juice or rhythm to it. But then when people spoke about Maxis, it was all the opposite. It was really exciting and, you know, fabulous stuff. So I thought, you know what, let's make a documentary on Maxis, like Tommy Dean wanted. And we'll see what I do with this Sid stuff later on, you know. I'm, I'm including some of the footage of Sid live on Maxis, as well as Jane playing with The Fast and oh, Bad yeah. Boys, El Elliot Murphy, all the stuff, you know. And we're basically telling the story of Max's, how it started in 65, how it became this rock and roll venue in 1969, 70 with the Velvet Underground and the first shows that Danny Field brought over there with the Stooges and Alice Cooper and stuff. And, you know, and how old, how all um, happened from there with the New York Dolls playing there and everything, you know. And that's, that's what we're doing. And before we get too deep into the actual story, um, as you've done in the past, you've mentioned that you're doing a crowdfunding campaign um, just until the end of this year with some really great perks for people who donate. Um, no matter how you're watching this interview, whether it's on the website, on YouTube, uh, the podcast, there'll be the link for the crowdfunding right there. But talk a bit about how people can get involved and what's available for the people who do get involved. Yeah, I mean, uh, people can go to Indiegogo.com and check our project there, nightclubbing, and, uh, you know, they can participate donating from 10 euros to thousands, you know, if, you know, they can, from, for 10 euros, you get your name on the end credits and you enter this raffle, we're uh, raffling, um, you know, an item from Steve Bader's, which is a PVC holster that was donated by one of his friends in Paris. And then, you know, you get DVDs and posters and t-shirts and all sorts of stuff, you know. Now, and basically we, we, we need this money to pay, you know, help us pay for this photography and footage and music rights that we need to complete the film. Now, Jane, early in your career, um, you worked with Andy Warhol and, you know, the factory crowd. Was he sort of your entry to the Max's scene? Oh, Lord, no. <laughs> uh, 
Lee, Lee Black Childress, the photographer, uh, mm -hmm. took me to Max's for the first time. He was uh, photographing Jackie's wedding. Jackie Curtis, one of Warhol's uh, superstars who starred in um, Flesh, Warhol's Flesh. And she was getting married to the maitre d' at Max's. And so he went to film it. And then, of course, everyone after, uh, he didn't show up for his own wedding. He <laughs> never showed up. Poor Jackie was stranded at the altar. <laughs> so she grabbed somebody else and married them. <laughs> <laughs> she wanted to be married. It didn't matter who. <laughs> and then after the party, after the marriage ceremony and everything, everyone went to Max's and Lee told me all about it. And he brought me to Max's for the first time. And I was up for the very first time you go into Max's, you're a bit intimidated. You know, you really are. You, you, you don't know what's up, you know, and people are, are looking at you like trying to figure out who you are, what you are, what you're doing in there. And, you know, people also could at times be very, really vicious and nasty, some of them. And, um, so I was very intimidated, but once I got broken in, I, I, I practically lived there. <laughs> I was there practically every night. And now there were kind of two distinct eras of Max's, sort of the yeah. up to 1974 with the, the real glam scene, and then kind of the punks after 75. And yeah. now does the film kind of cover both of those scenes, or do you lean more toward the post-75? I mean, oh, it covers I it covers both scenes really, mm -hmm. you know, because because the whole punk thing starts with the New York Dolls and suicide and the Stooges playing there, so we had to obviously cover the first incarnation of Maxis when Mickey Ruskin was running it as well. Otherwise, the story doesn't make any sense, you know. Mm -hmm. And Jane, you're one of the few people that really bridged both of those. I scenes. bridged both of them. Yes, yeah. I DJ both of them as well. Did you did it feel different? Was there a different vibe in the club during each of those times? Yes, it, it, it was a little bit different. I thought that uh, during Mickey Ruskin's period, things were a little more serious minded because you had a lot of artists coming in there who were serious artists and uh, they were hanging out in there and uh, it was a little more serious. People want people a little bit, bit more reserved. But then when Tommy Dean's matches came along, all hell broke loose. <laughs> it was just, um, you know, rock and roll hell, mm -hmm. you know, uh, decadence galore. Mm -hmm. um, uh, people fucking in the telephone booth and, and uh, it just it was, it became an outrageous place to hang out. And mm -hmm. all the bands hung out there, like, you know, everybody from the Dolls. Uh, I was hanging out there with my band and then people like would come into town, like Bowie and people like that and they would they would come to hang out at matches they have, i think most celebrities uh, in the rock world when they came in came into new york city matches was like probably number one on their list to go to yeah and you know danny as you tell the story of matches in the documentary i mean in addition to jane were you able to get any of the other people that were there back then yeah yeah we got um ruby lynn uh from Ruby and the Rednecks, we got Alice Cooper. Yeah, a bunch of people, you know, Jimmy Lumia, uh, Peter Crowley, you know, people that were, that hung out there, yeah. yeah and or I think worked we, there. Yeah, well, and that's the thing too, is, you know, with, back in that day with the clubs like that, the people that work there were almost as famous as the people that came in to it. And, and they were the ones that really had the stories. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, we got people like Donna Destry and obviously Jane, you know, okay. without without whom we couldn't have made this, you know. Mm. And I think when you look at the crowd and the bands in the back room at Max's, compared to what was going on down the road a bit at CBGB's, it seemed to me, and I was a little too young to, you know, be there back then, but it, it seemed to me that Max's was a more inclusive scene. You know, while some bands played both, you know, you weren't going to see Springsteen pop up at CBGB's. Uh, and it doesn't seem like the bands like the Dolls or even Jane yourself, you know, the, and the Warhol crowd would have been as welcome at CBGB's as you were at Max's. What do you think led to kind of the openness at Max's? Uh, uh, Max's was a very diverse crowd. You had everything. You had snobby rich people hanging out with drug addicts and you had uh, 
boys and girls and boy girls and 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 all kinds of people it was diverse you had everything it wasn't a gay club of course but gay people were welcome mm -hmm. uh, uh, as long as you did as long as as long as nikki liked you if nikki didn't like you no matter what you were he was not going to let you in mm -hmm. you know so you really had to be nice to me to mickey and um yeah it, it was matches was a little more serious i think and cbgb's uh, uh cbgb's was um um I mean, Max was uh, getting mixed up now, Max and CBGBs. Yeah, at one time, there was kind of a war between CBGBs and Max, you know, and, and if you played one place, you couldn't play the other. It got really bad for a while, but then it got ironed out. If you, if you played CBGBs, you weren't expected to play matches for like a long, long time, you know, and, and, and lots of jealousy between the two clubs occurred. And it also, uh, it occurred, uh, it, what sparked it was when I had to fight with Dick Manitoba on stage and, and, and um, he, he got injured. We had a big fight and people at CBGB's, on stage at CBGB's, and people divided up between the Max crowd and the CBGB's crowd, between the Wayne County crowd and the Dick Manitoba crowd. And that added to the, to the turbulence of uh, both clubs and the whole scene, really. The whole scene kind of suffered because of that. People thought the scene was kind of like, you know, people like that. People jumping up on stage and beating each other up, you know, <laughs> that's, that's what made the press. <laughs> yeah, and I think in the end, you know, CBGB's was able to evolve a bit into the 80s and began to bring in bands that didn't have the New York, you know, core to them. And they basically became just a kind of another venue on the touring circuit. It Whereas did. Max's, once that New York scene died down, the club went with it. Do you think there would yeah. have been a way for the club to evolve and grow the way CBGB's did? Or was it such a New York institution that once that scene went, it was over? Max's was truly unique. And I don't think that it could have gone on, really. I don't, I don't, I mean, it, maybe a new owner, another new owner could have come in and made it into something else. They tried, they tried to resurrect matches a couple of times. They had a matches Kansas City uptown and it worked for a couple of months, but people, it just didn't catch on at all, you know. So, um, um, <clears throat> I, I, I would say that's probably the way it is and what people remember it as well. Yeah. And Danny, as you're, doing this I mean what was like the biggest thing that you learned about something that was going on at Max's that you didn't already know going into it me yeah well basically um the fact that Tommy Dean was doing this counterfeit operation from the basement you know, I just thought that was brilliant <laughs> but you know Max's was super important because not only you know, it brought all the Warhol scene and the Velvets and then the Dolls and stuff, and then the Punks. But also the hardcore scene started developing at Max's before CBGB was accepting it, you know? Like bad, people like Bad Brains and Stimulators and, you know, Reagan Youth, all that stuff. Um, Heart Attack, all those bands were playing Max's and that developed the New York hardcore scene. Mm -hmm before Max is closed in December 81, you know. But I mean, the story is really fascinating, you know, of the, the, the volume of culture that we've gotten, that the world has gotten because of Max, it's because of how wild it was and how, how wild the bands that play there were, you know. I mean, it's changed popular culture, you know, mm -hmm. way before CBGBs existed. But the thing is, Max has disappeared in 81 and then, MTV happened and then CBGB's was elected, you know, the house of punk, you know, and, and, and it's partly true, but then Max's was before and was the genesis of all of that, really, you know. I mean, I, I know Max's from Johnny Thunder's albums, Life on Max's Kansas City, and then the Velvet Life on Max's Kansas City. So it is really a legendary place that, you know, it's cool that it's not forgotten you know everybody knows CBGB's the new generations don't, don't have a, a clue of what Max's was so it's a very interesting story really to tell yeah, yeah. and it's 
funny because you know you brought up some of the records recorded there and you know that's i think you know as a, a music fan i think that was the thing that made max's stand out is the just the volume of live recordings that came out of max's kansas city i know jane you had one yourself and you didn't really see that at cvgb so you know and i think that goes to show sort of how seriously they took the music at max's is the sound yeah. in the place was good enough to record you know jane what do you remember about yeah. playing there Oh yeah, playing there was 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 uh, my first gig. There was uh, during the Nicky Ruskin period with my band Queen Elizabeth, <clears throat> and we played there. And um, we we were just very excited to play there. We were going to play Max's, you know, and uh, we had a great crowd. And uh, all sorts of people came to see me, like Steven Tyler, and Alice Cooper. I think came to see me, and a lot of big names came to see me. And um, <clears throat> I started really getting a name out there because of playing at Max's, you know, my name started to grow. And, you know, people started to hear about me more and write about me more. And um, I think one of the reasons that Max's could not be duplicated today is because it was so diverse and everyone got along, got along with each other inside of Max's. They got along, they dished each other and they, they could be vicious and nasty to each other, but they really, there really was a, a sense of being together there. I mean, there's a story about the back room of matches. You didn't dare walk out of the back room of matches with your back to the crowd because they start talking about you, <laughs> saying horrible things. So you backed out of the room. <laughs> 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 yeah and jane it's been so many years now but do you keep in touch with any of the people that are still around from that period oh yeah so um, i keep in contact with peter crowley who booked the bands at matches during the Tommy Dean era and um i keep in contact with with all sorts of people like donna destry and uh, paul zong from the fast and and uh, quite a few so uh, uh, quite a few that i used to keep in contact with have passed on unfortunately mm. but yeah i've managed to to keep up keep track of a lot of the people i thought i, th I think it's really important you know it's, it's like it, it's like kind of like woodstock but it's matches you know <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and when going back to the crowdfunding campaign on this, one of the great perks in the campaign that definitely caught my eye is the chance to attend the New York premiere of the movie. And you know, do you guys have anything kind of being planned for that? Jane, will you be up back up in New York? And you know, Danny, any ideas if people involved in the movie will be there? Well, that's the idea, you know, getting people like Bob Gruen. Whoever is around, you know, obviously down the destry, the, the locals, I hope they will attend and help us out with a bit of a Q&A, hopefully, you know, it's going to be an interesting event for sure. Mm -hmm. And Jane, you think you'll make the trip up for it? I think I'll be able to, yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't travel the way I used to. I used to travel a lot, but I guess I, I can make short trips now, yeah. And that, that sounds like an important one to go to. I, would, I think I'd like I'd like that. And, and mm -hmm. Jane, have, if, do you still get a chance to play at all? I mean, when was the last time you've been on stage? Oh, last time I was on stage a couple of years ago down here in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, I have a have my own band down here. I'm also working with the A.M. Taylor, who is a a trans guitar legend down here, and we we've, we've made some. I think I lost you. But uh, if, it's, if something really important came up, I could I could do it. I would I would I would just buckle down and do it. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, yeah, the last time I played was down here in Atlanta, Georgia. Mm -hmm. well, packed audience. I was really surprised. People really knew who I was, and they all came to see me and. It was a great night, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we've been spending some time here with Danny Garcia and Jane County. We're talking about the new film called Night Clubbing, The Birth of Punk Rock in New York City. It's the story of Max's Kansas City. 
There's an Indiegogo crowdfunding campaign where you can take part, help fund the movie and get some great items, including a chance to attend the New York premiere. So I encourage everyone to check it out um, as soon as possible. They get a, date, they get a free date with Jane too. <laughs> well, uh, I'm sure that one will go for the most. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I just want to thank both of you. Um, you know, it, Jane, it's been an honor having you on here. Danny, it's always great to talk to you. You know, whenever you thank have you. a project, just let me know and we'll get the word out there. And uh, hopefully you. we'll see both of you guys up in New York sometime soon. Yeah. Thank That's you. the idea. <laughs> Thanks for having us. My pleasure. Thank you, guys. All, All right. right. Yeah. Talk to you Bye. soon. Yep.